The Luftwaffe's bombers sowed the wind in Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and dozens and dozens of other places. Across Europe and North Africa, Goering's fighters and dive bombers ruled the air. But now things have changed, and the Luftwaffe is fighting desperately to hold back the Allied advance. Across the Reich, it is German cities now reaping the whirlwind. In the east, the once subdued Red Air Force is contesting the skies. And in the Mediterranean, the Western Allies have superiority. So, in December 1943, we must ask, is the mighty Luftwaffe a spent force? <laughs> I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special on the current state of the Luftwaffe. I can answer my own question easily enough. No, the Luftwaffe is not a spent force. But if things carry on as they are now, it soon will likely be. It is spread thin and taking an absolute battering as it fights against an enemy coalition with more aircraft, more pilots, and greater production capacity. Oh, it can still make the Allies seriously bleed. The losses in British and American bombers this year have been horrific. But the problem is that the air war is now one of attrition. And the Germans cannot keep up with their enemy. Worse still, the attitudes of Hitler and other members of German high command are sabotaging any chance of recovery. I'm going to split this video up into two sections, one looking at the first half of the year and the Eastern and Mediterranean fronts, and one looking at the second half of the year and the combined bomber offensive over the Reich. Let's begin with the East, where 40% of the Luftwaffe's strength is deployed at the start of 1943. As of December 30th, 1942, the Luftwaffe had about 1,500 aircraft in the East. And though it bounces back pretty quickly from the defeat at Stalingrad, about 500 transport aircraft alone were lost. And that's not to mention the loss of personnel. It's estimated that about a thousand pilots have been killed, wounded, or captured. The commander of Luftflotte 4, the air fleet which had been responsible for Stalingrad, Wolfram Freiherr von Richthofen, reorganizes his forces. He kicks out some of the less competent senior officers and sends depleted formations back to the Reich to form new units after resting and refitting. By March, his forces are managing 1,200 sorties per day, up from the 350 or so they did in the dark days of January. In North Africa, though, things are going very badly indeed for the Luftwaffe. By the time the Axis are pinned into a corner of Tunisia in March 1943, the Allies have aerial superiority. The German transport aircraft are particularly vulnerable to free-roaming Allied aircraft. The Luftwaffe loses 50 Ju-52s on April 18th alone in the Palm Sunday Massacre. But they keep feeding aircraft into that theater. For the limited strategic gain of holding on to Tunisia for six months, losses in the Mediterranean are close to 900 fighters, almost 1,000 bombers and dive bombers, and 370 transports from November 42 to May 43. Together with other losses, it's a total of 2,422 aircraft, about 40% of the Luftwaffe's total strength. Again, though, it's not just the planes. Think of the man hours, the money, and, and the other resources that are put into training the pilots lost at Stalingrad and Tunisia. The years of experience that some of these guys have, that's all gone. As one senior Luftwaffe officer sums up the situation to a colleague in Allied captivity, you cannot imagine how catastrophic the air personnel situation is. We have no crews. All the instructor crews were shot down in the Junkers. And then there's the Battle of Kursk, which isn't just a battle of tanks. The air combat is some of the most intense of the entire war. It pits a reinvigorated Red Air Force supported by Lend-Lease against a Luftwaffe that is in decline, but which still packs a mighty punch. The Luftwaffe deploys some 1,900 aircraft and the German pilots really earn their Reichsmarks. They fly 3,000 sorties on the opening day alone, with some pilots flying six missions, and they do inflict heavy losses. But the Soviets have more aircraft, and they gain aerial supremacy. Red Air Force bombers are soon hitting German airplanes on the ground. Defeat at Kursk contributes to the loss of 1,030 German planes in the East in July and August 1943. Taken together with the other theaters of the war, losses are 3,213 planes, or 51% of total strength over those two months. 
The thing is, though, the Germans can afford to absorb these shocks. They are not pleasant, but they're not fatal either. But in the West, over the Reich itself, the situation is a bit different. And here we see the beginning of the end for the Luftwaffe during the combined bomber offensive. Now, before we get into that, let's be clear about two things. A, what we're looking at here is not the overall effect of the bombing campaign. We're only looking at the part relevant to the Luftwaffe. For the campaign to break Germany's morale and war industry, you'll have to follow our War Against Humanity series, where Sparty covers that week by week. B, the engagement of the Luftwaffe happens as part of the bombing campaign, but as we've just seen, it could just as well have happened on the front lines as over German cities. It's an important distinction as the net positive effect of the combined bomber offensive is highly debatable and indeed hotly debated. Again, watch War Against Humanity to follow how that story develops. That said, there is a part of the combined bomber offensive agreed upon between the United States and Britain at the Trident Conference in May that is relevant to what we're looking at today. The Point Blank Directive that the German fighter force must be neutralized. In 1943, that does not get off to a good start. First of all, Arthur Harris, head of RAF Bomber Command, boycotts the plan, insisting instead on pursuing the bombing of civilians. Only under enforced orders does he pursue a fraction of the raids against the German airplane industry and aerodromes intended to be carried out, supposed to be carried out, by the RAF. As we shall see, the USAAF under Karl Spatz tries to pursue it, but with mixed results. In any case, the overall war in the skies of Western Europe does engage the Luftwaffe. And with so much force deployed in the East and the Mediterranean, defenses over the Reich are in a poor state. At the start of 1943, Germany relies on just 250 to 300 day fighters scrambling in piecemeal formations from sites in Holland and Brittany. The Germans are even forced to press valuable night fighters into daytime fighting. This system is inadequate to meet the ever-increasing number of four-engine heavies like B-17s and B-24s. The only way for the Germans to solve the problem is by transferring fighters from the East and the Mediterranean in the second half of the year. The force defending the Reich grows from 600 fighters to 800 in July and 1,000 in October. By December 1943, 70% of the Luftwaffe's fighters will be defending the Reich from the combined bomber offensive. This means that German fighters over the Eastern Front and the Mediterranean become a rarer sight. And the strength and forces over Germany are able to inflict heavy damage on the enemy bombers. This is most apparent in the two Schweinfurt raids launched by the USAAF. These raids hope to paralyze aircraft production by targeting ball bearing factories and Messerschmitt works. The first raid in August 1943 is a real disaster for the attackers though, with the 8th losing 60 B-17s, about 10% of its strength. Things are even worse on the second raid on October the 14th, in which the Germans deploy new tactics and weapons. Twin engine fighters evade the overlapping defensive gunfire of the bombers by firing rockets from a thousand meters away. Even when those rockets don't hit, they force the Americans to break formation. Then, it's the turn of the single engine fighters like the Messerschmitt 109 and the Focke Wolf 190. They've recently been fitted with heavier armaments and they pounce on bombers that leave the herd or fall behind with damage. One American airman will later recall the nightmarish mission. Never had we seen so many Germans in the sky at one time and never had their attacks seemed so well coordinated. Wherever one looked in the sky, there were Germans attacking and B-17s smoking, burning, spinning down. The loss 77 B-17s on the second raid caps a terrible week in which the 8th loses 148 bombers. The situation is so bad that the USAAF suspends deep penetration missions over Germany. For now, raids will be limited to targets in France, the European coastline, and the Ruhr Valley, which are within range of escort fighters. This is a big relief to the Germans. Add to that that although the raids do hit the ball bearing and aircraft production facilities, production is back up and running before there is any effect on output. 
things aren't going any better for the RAF than they are for the USAAF, Harris started the year off believing his force was finally ready to bring Germany to its knees. Four-engine bombers like the Sterling, Halifax, and Lancaster reached frontline squadrons in greater numbers than ever before. New navigational aids like OBO, targeting systems like the H-2S radar, and the use of Pathfinder bombers gives the bombers greater capabilities at night and in all weather conditions. Despite that his raids inflict some devastating damage on German cities in the Battle of the Ruhr between March and July 43, and the firebombing of Hamburg, which kills 40,000 people, the failure of German morale and the hoped-for uprising against Hitler do not materialize. And despite their initial unpreparedness, the Luftwaffe soon prove themselves an effective adversary at night, too. The Germans develop a new tactic called Wilde Sau, or Wild Boar, in which ground controllers vector day fighters onto a flight of bombers. Searchlights, pyrotechnics, and tracer rounds from flat cannons help the fighters home in on their targets. New night fighters like the JU-88G and the HE-219 come into service along with a radar system called SN-2. This helps the fighters overcome the jamming effect of window, the aluminum strips which had caused havoc when dropped by RAF bombers over Hamburg. Some aircraft also have an upward firing bank of guns they call Schrage Musik, which allows them to hit Lancasters from below, thus avoiding their defensive gunners. All of these factors, and bad weather, mean that the massive assault that Harris has just this fall launched on Berlin will be an overall defeat for Bomber Command and will be called off in March 1944. So, have the Allies bitten off more than they can chew? Well, both sides are inflicting huge losses on each other. The terrible American losses at Schweinfurt were inflicted at a cost of 25 lost German fighters in the first raid, 35 in the second. Luftwaffe records indicate losses of 42% of their fighter force in October. Likewise, night fighter crews suffer loss rates of up to 15% per month. In the period between July and November 1943, German losses in defensive Western Europe are higher than in any other theater. 2,700 aircraft, or 42%, of all German losses. This is compared to 28% on the Eastern Front, 30% in the Mediterranean. These losses are not just down to the enemy. Inexperienced crews and bad winter weather cause a high rate of non-combat losses. The Allies can sustain these losses, but the Germans can't. This is mainly because of the aircraft production problem. Technocrats like Luftwaffe Field Marshal Erhard Milch have been calling for increased fighter production for years, but have run into continuous opposition. Back in March 1942, Luftwaffe Chief of Staff Hans Jeschonek said to Milch, I do not know what I should do with more than 360 fighters. In January of this year, Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering, head of the Luftwaffe, suggested increasing fighter production, but for use as fighter bombers, not as interceptors. Jeschonek committed suicide in August because of the Luftwaffe's failures, but before that, he did allow Milch to step up fighter production, and Milch has done well, but not well enough. Even after increasing production by 125% compared to last year, Milch will not reach his target of 2,000 aircraft per month. There are several issues. German industry is dispersed across the Reich to begin with, relying on foreign territory under occupation, and the response to bombing disperses it even more. Already before the war, a lack of access to their own natural resources is an issue plaguing the Germans. Milking the occupied territories has not been as rewarding as the Nazis had hoped. And as 1943 progresses, that occupied territory is shrinking anyway. Logistics has always been an Achilles heel for the Germans. And as the Allies advance, resistance sabotage increases, and the SS keeps diverting trains for the genocide of Europe's Jewish population. So, they have fewer raw materials, that have to be distributed to more places and parts produced further and further apart with ever decreasing transport capacity. After the war, Milch will explain, we were not able to produce 
more than those thousand fighters a month from August 43 until February 44. The additional number which we would have produced was destroyed. Because of this, the number of fighters available for frontline service stays pretty much steady at between 1,500 and 1,800 over the second half of the year. This problem will not be fixed until, until it's too late. Hitler refuses to give the production of fighters the real attention that it needs. Instead, he's obsessed with the idea of retaliation. He says, terror can only be broken with terror. The German people demand reprisals. He refuses to consider reducing bomber production in favor of fighters. He and Albert Speer continue pouring resources into the strategically irrelevant V1 and V2 programs. It won't be until next year that aircraft production gets a significant boost. Under Milch and Speer, monthly production will reach highs of over 3,500. Mm -hmm. In fact, 1944, the Germans will build more aircraft than the British. 40,000 versus 26,000. Now this owl sounds very good, but it will still fall short of Milch's target of 80,000 planes per year by 1945. And the Americans alone produce a whopping 96,000 planes in 1944. Not only will the Germans be unable to match the Allies quantitatively, but they also fall behind qualitatively. Already the Allies are fixing their, their main weakness in the air. At the second Schweinfurt raid, the fighters were unable to escort the bombers all the way to the target. But now, drop tanks allow American fighters to fly further into the Reich. When Goering hears of this in November, he dismisses the threat, but as we shall see in spring of next year, these long-range fighters will come to dominate the airspace over Germany. They will protect Allied bombers as they fly over the Reich and its occupied territories. This will only turn up the pressure on the Luftwaffe. It is not a spent force yet, but it soon may be. If you would like to see how the Luftwaffe fared when the Axis invaded the Soviet Union back in 1941, you can click right here for an awesome video about that. And if you'd like more specials like this, and I have to say, we apologize for the months this year we were unable to make a lot of specials, but if you want more, join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. See you next time.